Welcome to Management 2110's Chapter 12 Lecture, based on the readings from the textbook, Management, 14th edition, by Robinson Coulter. So let's get started. First, we'll cover the learning objectives for Chapter 12. We're going to explain the importance of human resource management and the human resource management process. Then we're going to describe the external influences that affect the human resource management process. Then we're going to discuss the tasks associated with identifying and selecting component employees or competent uh, employees. Uh, then we're going to know how to write effective job descriptions. We're going to develop our skills at being a good interviewer. Then we're going to explain how companies uh, provide employees with skills and knowledge. We're going to describe strategies for retaining competent and high performing employees. Then we're going to discuss contemporary issues in managing human resources. We're going to move on. Human resource management is important for three reasons. First, as various studies have concluded, it can be a significant source of competitive advantage. And that's true for organizations around the world, not just U.S. firms. Uh, second, human resource management is an important part of organizational strategies. Achieving competitive success through people uh, means managers must change how they think about their employees and how they view the uh, work relationship. And then finally, the way organizations treat their people has been found to significantly impact organizational performance. For instance, uh, one study that reported that improving work practices could increase market value by as much as 30 percent. So it's very significant. So the common thread among these practices seems to be a commitment to involving employees, improving the knowledge, skills, and abilities of an organization's employees, increasing their motivation, reducing loafing on the job, and enhancing the retention of quality employees while encouraging low performers to leave. Now, even if an organization doesn't use high performance work practices, other specific human resource management activities uh, must be completed in order to ensure that the organization has qualified people to perform the work that needs to be done in the activities that compose the uh, HRM or human resource management process. So here we have exhibit 12-1 illustrating various high performance work uh, practices. Uh, and practices entail um, an array of activities, self-managed teams, uh, decentralized decision making, uh, touched on some of that in the previous chapter, uh, training programs to develop knowledge, skills, and abilities, flexible job assignments, open communication, performance-based compensation, staffing based on person-job uh, and person-organization fit, um, you know, which is very, it's like um, specific staffing uh, processes. And then extensive employee involvement, giving employees more control over decision making, which was empowerment. We touched on that last chapter and increasing employee access to information. So exhibit 12-2 shows the eight activities in the process. Uh, the first of the three activities, the first three activities ensure that competent employees are identified and selected. The next two involve providing employees with up-to-date knowledge and skills. And the final three ensures that the organization retains competent and high-performing employees. Now, before we discuss those specific activities, we need to look at external factors that affect the HRM process. So the entire HRM process is influenced by the external environment. Now, those factors uh, most directly uh, influencing it uh, include the economy, employee labor unions, governmental laws and regulations, 
and demographic trends. Now, the global economic downturn has left what many experts believe to be an enduring mark on the human resource management pra uh, practices worldwide. Now, in the United States, labor economists say that although jobs may be coming back slowly, they aren't the same ones that employees were used to. Now, many of these jobs were temporary or contract positions rather than full-time jobs with benefits. A labor union is an organization that represents workers and seeks to protect their interests through collective bargaining. In unionized organizations, many human resource management decisions are dictated by collective bargaining agreements, which usually define things such as recruitment sources, criteria for hiring, promotions and layoffs, uh, training eligibility, and disciplinary practices. Now, work stops, labor disputes, and negotiations between management and labor are just a few of the challenges organizations and managers face when their workforce is unionized. An organization's human resource management practices are governed by a country's laws. A number of important laws and regulations affect what you can and cannot do legally as a manager. Now, because workplace lawsuits are increasingly targeting supervisors as well as their organizations, managers must know what they can and cannot do by law. Now, Exhibit 12-3, which we'll cover uh, momentarily for some of the important U.S. laws that affect HRM processes. Um, so we'll show that here in a minute. But just know that many organizations have affirmative action programs to ensure that decisions and practices enhance the employment, upgrading, and retention of members from protected groups such as minorities and females. That is, an organization refrains from discrimination and actively seeks to enhance the status of members from protected groups. Now, we do want to mention uh, two current laws that each have potential to affect future human resources practices. Uh, the first of these, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, the PPACA, commonly called the Health Care uh, Reformed Act, was signed into law in March of 2010 and upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States in 2012. And then the other was the Social Networking Online Protection Act, the SNOPA, and it has been introduced and would prohibit employers from requiring a username and password or other access to online content. Now this is the Exhibit 12-3 that we talked about a few minutes ago, depicting various major human resource management laws, equal opportunity laws and discrimination. I'm going to leave this up here. We have the Equal Pay Act of 1963 that prohibits pay differences for equal work based on gender. Next, you have the uh, Civil Rights Act, Title VII. We, ta we talked about this one in previous chapters. That prohibits the uh, discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, or gender. Then we have the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and that was in 1967. That prohibits discrimination based on against uh, employees 40 years and older. Then you have the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973. That prohibits discrimination based on the basis of physical or mental disabilities. And then you have the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And that prohibits discrimination against individuals who have disabilities or chronic illnesses also requires reasonable accommodations for these individuals. Now, continuing with 12-3, the human resources laws relevant to compensation and benefits, they encompass the Worker Adjustment and Retraining Notification Act. It was enacted in 1990. That requires employers with 
more than 100 employees to provide 60 days notice before a mass layoff or facility closing. Then you have the Family and Medical Leave Act, and that uh, was in 1993, gives employees and organizations with 50 or more employees up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave each year for family or medical reasons. Next, you have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act um, from 1996. That permit, uh, permits portability of employees insurance from one employer to another. And then you have the Lilly Ledbetter uh, Fair Pay Act 2009 changes the statute of limitations on pay discrimination to 180 days from each paycheck. And then you have the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, and that's health care legislation that puts in place comprehensive health insurance reforms. Now we're going to finalize 12-3 with human resource management laws relevant to health and safety. Now you have your Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA. Now everybody knows OSHA uh, from 1970. It establishes mandatory safety and health standards in organizations. Then you have the Privacy Act of 1974. That gives employees the legal right to examine personnel files and letters of reference. And then you have the Consolidated Omnibus Reconciliation Act, which is COBRA. And that's in 1995, and that continues, requires continued health uh, coverage following termination. Um, but however, it's paid by the employee, not by the employer. Now, what about human resource management laws globally? It's important that managers and other uh, countries be familiar with the specific laws that apply there. In Western Europe, two of the most common forms of representative uh, participation are work councils and board representatives. Work councils link employees with management. They are groups of nominated or elected employees who must be consulted when management makes decisions involving personnel. Board representatives are employees who sit on a company's board of directors and represent the interests of the firm's employees. Now, workforce trends in the early 21st century will be notable for three reasons. First, changes in racial and ethnic uh, composition. Second, an aging baby boom generation. And third, an expanding cohort of Generation Y workers. Now, meanwhile, the labor force is aging. The 55 and older uh, age group, which currently makes up 13% of the workforce, will increase to 20% by 2014. Another group that's having a significant impact on today's workforce is Generation Y, a population group that includes individuals born from about 1978 to 1994. Generation Y has been the fastest growing segment of the workforce, increasing from 14% to more than 24%. With, gener with Generation Y now in the workforce, analysts point to to the four generations that are working side by side in the workplace. Now, human resource planning is the process by which managers ensure that they have the right number of kinds of capable people in the right places and at the right times. Now, through planning, organizations avoid sudden people shortages and surpluses. Human resource planning entails two steps. Uh, first, assessing current human resources. And second, meeting hum uh, future human resource needs. Now, under current assessment, we're thinking job analysis. And that's an assessment that defines jobs and behaviors necessary to perform them. Uh, job description, that's position description. 
a written statement that describes a job and then you have job specifications and that's a written statement of the minimum qualifications a person must possess to perform a given job successfully. Now managers begin human resource planning by inventorying current employees. This inventory um, usually includes information on employees such as name, education, um, training, um, prior employment, languages spoken, uh, special capabilities and special skills. Uh, sophisticated databases make uh, getting and keeping this type of information quite easy. Now, meeting future HR needs, uh, human resource needs, increased scrutiny and selection process. So, future human resource needs are determined by the organization's mission, uh, goals, and strategies. So, all those human resource management uh, efforts uh, that are um, derived from the needs are going to correspond with the mission, goals, and strategies. And companies that do not carefully scrutinize the qualifications or backgrounds of employees surely pose risk of increased liability, poor reputation, and a lower performance. So the uh, demand for employees results from the demand for the organization's products or services. So after assessing both current uh, capabilities and future needs, managers can estimate areas in which the organization will be understaffed or overstaffed. Then they're ready to proceed to the next step in the HR uh, process. Now, a driver at Fresh Direct, an online grocer that delivers food to masses of uh, apartment-dwelling New Yorkers, was charged with and later pled guilty to stalking and harassing female customers. San Francisco and Los Angeles prosecutors have accused the uh, ride-hailing service Uber of misleading the public about their rigor of driver background checks and the claim of safety uh, you can trust. You know, the, the, the old slogan, safety you can trust. Now, the prosecutors maintain that Uber's uh, selection process led to the employment of individuals using false names and convicted of sex offenses, murder, and kidnapping. So, what do these outcomes suggest? Both uh, companies have used selection processes that do not consistently screen out uh, unsuitable applicants. So, recruitment and decruitment. Recruitment, locating, identifying, and attracting capable applicants, and decruitment, reducing an organization's workforce. Now, if employee uh, vacancies exist, managers should use the information gathered through job analysis to guide them in recruitment. Uh, that is, locating, identifying, and attracting capable applicants. Now, on the other hand, if human resource planning uh, shows a surplus of employees, managers may want to reduce the organization's workforce through decruitment. Now, Exhibit 12-4 explains different recruitment sources managers can use to find potential job uh, candidates. Uh, internet, employee referrals, company website, college recruiting, and professional recruiting organizations are all popular. Now, next to each one are associated um, advantages and disadvantages, like for internet, yeah, you reach a large number of people and you can get immediate feedback, but uh, it generates many unqualified candidates because you're dealing with masses. Um, you're also just putting it out there. You're not pinpointing. You're not being strategic about it. Uh, you're just putting it out to the masses. Now, in employee referrals, those advantages encompass uh, knowledge about the organization provided by current employees. And it can generate strong candidates because a good referral reflects on the uh, recommender. Now, a disadvantage, may not, it may not increase the diversity and mix 
of employees because you are targeting okay and you're only going by recommendations um, for company websites sure there's a wide distribution you can target uh, specific groups however it generates many unqualified candidates again um, you know people are could be finding you off of a Google search and uh, you know you you don't know who you're gonna get you don't know who you're attracting uh, college recruiting uh, produces a large centralized body of candidates uh, however it's uh, only usually uh, limited to entry-level positions um, because you can't go for higher level positions you know you have your candidates are just uh, getting their uh, education uh, they may be lacking certain skills and abilities at this point so you can really only offer entry-level positions here um, the professional recruiting organizations are uh, very popular now and that's because you get a good knowledge of industry challenges and requirements um, however there's little commitment to specific organizations um, essentially people are more committed to the job job specifications job uh, you know job description um, they're not really looking uh, for a specific organization so the other approach to controlling labor supply is decruitment which is not a pleasant task for any manager now decruitment options are illustrated here in exhibit 12-5 that's firing layoffs attrition uh, transfers reduced work weeks early retirements and job sharing Now once you have a pool of candidates, the next step in the human resource management process is selection. Screening job applicants to determine who is the best qualified for the job. And managers need to select carefully since hiring errors can have significant implications uh, for the organization. Now selection involves predicting which applicants will be successful if hired. And as shown here in Exhibit 12-6, any selection decision can result in four possible outcomes so two correct and two errors and we're going to move on to that um, exhibit 12-6 so as illustrated here uh, any selection decision can result in four possible outcomes two correct and two errors um, a decision is correct when the applicant was predicted to be successful and prove to be successful on the job or when the applicant was predicted to be unsuccessful and was not hired. In this uh, first instance we have successfully accepted and in the second we have successfully rejected. Now, federal employment laws prohibit managers from using a test score to select employees unless clear evidence shows that once on the job, individuals with high scores on this test outperform individuals with the low test scores. On a test that's reliable, any single individual's score should remain fairly consistent over time, assuming that the characteristics being measured are also stable. Now, no selection device can be effective if it's not reliable. A growing number of companies are adopting new measure of recruitment effectiveness called quality of LL. Um, this measure looks at the contributions of good hires versus those of hires who have failed to live up to their potential. Now five key factors are considered in defining this quality measure. Now, Exhibit 12-7 lists the strengths and weaknesses of each. Now, because many selection tools have limited value for making selection decisions, managers should use those that effectively predict performance for a given job.
So over here on the left we have the tools, and then on the right we have the associated characteristics. Now for selection tools like uh, application forms, uh, almost universally used, most useful for gathering information, and they can predict job performance, but not easy uh, to create one that does. Um, it's really hard uh, to predict job performance just off of an application form. Uh, nonetheless, there are some out there that can um, prompt or you know uh, help extrapolate uh, certain information that would be indicative whether or not one will or, uh, perform well or perform not so well. Then you have written tests. Um, they must be job related. They include intelligence, aptitude, ability, personality, and interest tests. And they are popular um, now, especially when it comes down to aptitude and personality. Um, a lot of that has to do with uh, team building, team dynamics, uh, how a uh, leader will interact with a particular individual. So where a lot of times it's not necessarily a disqualifying tool, uh, maybe a certain personality um, that will, you know, that needs to be known um, for uh, specific team projects. Um, then you have performance simulation tests. Um, like I said, interviews, uh, they're almost universally used. Um, must know what you can and cannot ask. And it can be use, useful for uh, managerial positions. A lot of times uh, they're internal. Uh, background investigations, they're popular. Uh, physical examinations are for jobs that have certain physical requirements. Um, law enforcement, um, you know, firefighters are good examples. Now, one thing managers, uh, one thing managers need to uh, carefully watch is how they portray the organization and how the work an applicant will be doing. Um, if they tell applicants only the good aspects, they're likely to have a workforce that's dissatisfied and prone to high turnover because in the realities, um, you know, the realities will kick in and eventually uh, people will acknowledge that things aren't as promised. Uh, to increase employee job satisfaction and reduce uh, turnover, managers consider a, uh, should consider a realistic job preview. Um, one that includes both positive and negative information about the job and the company. So you just don't want to sell them the positives, you want to be honest with them and tell them about the negatives that they will experience on the job. Now a person starting a new job needs the same type of introduction to his or her job and the organization. Now this introduction is called an orientation. There are two types of orientations. Uh, work unit orientation familiarizes the employee with the goals of the uh, work unit. It clarifies how his or her job contributes to the unit's goals, and it includes an introduction to his or her coworkers. Um, organization orientation informs new employees about the company's goals, history, philosophy, uh, procedures, and roles. And it should also include relevant human resource policies and maybe even a tour of the facilities. Now, employee training is an important human resource uh, management activity. And as job demands change, employees' skills have to change. In 2011, U.S. business firms spent more than $59 billion on formal employee training. Managers, of course, are responsible for deciding what type of training employees need, when they need it, and what form that training should take. Now, employee training is an important human resource um, management activity, like we stated in the previous slide. Um, as those job demands change and employee skills have to change, 
and when an average U.S. company spent uh, $702 per employee for training, which, like we said in the previous slide, um, totaled in 2011 more than $59 billion. Now, in 2015, U.S. business firms uh, spent more than $70.6 billion on formal employee tra uh, training, so significantly more. Uh, managers, of course, are responsible for deciding what type of training employees need, um, when they need it, and what form that training should take. Now, Exhibit 12-8 it illustrates different types of training. You have your general, and that includes communication skills, computer systems, applications, and programming, customer service, executive development, management skills and development, personal growth, sales, supervisory skills, and technological skills and knowledge. Uh, and then you have your specific um, training, and that's basic life, work skills, creativity, Customer education, diversity slash cultural awareness, remedial writing, uh, managing change, leadership, product knowledge, public speaking slash presentation skills, safety, ethics, sexual harassment, team building, uh, wellness, and others. Now, Exhibit 12-9 provides a description of various traditional and technological-based training methods that managers might use. Uh, all of these training methods, experts believe that organizations will increasingly rely on e-learning and mobile applications to deliver important information and to develop employee skills. Continuing on with 12-9, uh, this, this slide provides a description of the various traditional and technology-based uh, training methods that managers will use. Um, this is just kind of a continuation. E-learning is growing. Um, cannot say that enough. Uh, as well as mobile learning. Coming very, very popular. A performance based management system establishes performance standards used to evaluate employee performance. Now, how do managers evaluate employees' performance? That's where the different performance appraisal methods come in. Now, although appraising someone's performance is never easy, especially with employees who aren't doing their jobs well, uh, managers can be better at it by using any of the seven different performance appraisal methods, along with providing frequent feedback. Now, a description of each of these methods, including advantages and disadvantages, is shown here in Exhibit 12-7. So, you have your written essay type, and that's where the evaluator uh, writes a description of employee strengths and weaknesses, past performance, and potential. Um, provides suggestions for improvement. Some of the uh, advantages, maybe it's, well, first it's simple to use. And uh, disadvantage uh, would be uh, maybe a better measure of the evaluator's writing ability than of the employee's actual performance. Um, you know, it, doesn't really keep the evaluator on course, and you'll find that uh, these types of uh, evaluations become highly uh, subjective. Um, critical incident, that's where the evaluator focuses on critical behaviors that separate effective and ineffective performance. Um, positive is uh, rich examples, behaviorally based. Um, you know, you're moving that, you're shifting that continuum to a little bit more of an objective one. Um, however, these are very time-consuming and, and they lack quantifiable measures. Um, next, you have the graphic rating scale. That's a popular method that lists a set of performance factors in an incremental scale. 
The evaluator goes down the list and rates the employee on each factor. On the upside, it provides uh, quantitative data, and it's not very time consuming. It keeps you on track, it gives you a category to look at. Uh, some of these are like uh, professionalism, uh, customer service, leadership, um, uh, uh, qualities, um, you know, tardiness, uh, attendance, you know. Um, and so it keeps the uh, rater on track. Um, one of the negatives, though, it doesn't provide in-depth information on job behavior. It's best that you're basically just giving them a rating um, without any corresponding uh, feedback. And these are just some more. You have the behaviorally anchored rating scale. And it's a popular approach that combines elements from critical incident and graphic rating scale. The evaluator uses a rating scale, but items are examples of actual job behaviors. So on the um, upside, um, On the upside, it focuses on specific and measurable job behaviors. And on the downside, these are very time consuming and difficult to develop. And if you have multiple uh, comparison, employees are re, uh, rated in comparison to others in the work group. On an upside, it compares employees with one another. Um, you, you know, you may have somebody who's uh, leading by example, uh, for, for example. Um, and it gives you a good illustration of telling somebody, you know, you want to be a lot more like, you know, Bob. You know, Bob uh, comes in one time, he does a great job, uh, customers love him. You know, and, you know, Bob maybe exemplifies all the behaviors and the categories you're looking at, and they're all positive behaviors. And, um, however, when you're dealing with a lot of employees, it's hard for them um, to use comparisons uh, using individuals. Um, and you have management by objective. Employees are evaluated on how well they accomplish specific goals. And on an upside, it focuses on goals and it's very results oriented. Um, but, however, it's very time consuming um, listing all those objectives. And then you have the 360 degree appraisal. And that utilizes feedback from supervisors, employees, and coworkers. So it covers a greater sphere. Um, you know, it's very thorough, however it's time consuming, and it does foster a lot of self-reflection. Um, so you have to have somebody who uh, has a lot of humility to uh, be able to sit down with a subordinate and listen to what the subordinate says. And a lot of times, too, um, in these types of appraisals, you have different, uh, different biases come into play. Um, you have like a validation uh, bias where like um, I, somebody may grab a subordinate to rate them um, and maybe somebody they know is going to say nice things about them. So you have a lot of biases associated with the 360 degree. It doesn't negate the fact that they are very effective if used correctly. Now just in case you think that compensation and benefit decisions aren't important, a survey showed that 71% of workers surveyed uh, said that their benefits package would influence their decision to leave their job. Now, managers must develop a compensation system that reflects the changing nature of work and the workplace in order to keep people motivated. Organizational compensation can include many different types of rewards and benefits such as base wages and salaries, wage and salary add-ons, incentive payments, and other benefits and services. Employee benefits commonly include offerings such as retirement benefits, health care insurance, and paid time off. Many organizations are addressing the needs of their diverse workforces through offering flexible work options and family-friendly benefits to accommodate employees' needs for work and family life balance. So you have this skill-based pay, a pay system that rewards employees for their job skills they can demonstrate, and then you have variable pay, and that's a pay system in which an individual's compensation is contingent on performance. 
Now, how do managers determine who gets paid what? Several factors influence the compensation and benefit packages that different employees receive. Exhibit 12-11 summarizes these factors, which are job-based and business or industry-based. And many organizations, however, are using alternative approaches to determining compensation, skill-based pay and variable pay. Now, downsizing or layoffs is the planned elimination of jobs in an organization. When an organization has too many employees, which can happen when it's faced with an economic recession or declining market share, uh, too aggressive growth or poorly managed operations, one option for improving profits is to eliminate some of those excess workers. Now, during most of the current economic recession, Many well-known companies downsized, including, among others, Boeing, uh, Nokia, uh, Procter & Gamble, Hewlett-Packard, Volkswagen, Dell, General Motors, uh, Siemens, Merck, Honeywell, and eBay. Uh, years since the recession ended, layoffs continued, although not as frequently. Some human resource experts suggest that a cost associated with mass layoffs is the damage that they can uh, cause to long-term growth prospects. So how can managers best uh, manage a downsized workplace? The disruptions in the workplace and in employees' personal lives could be expected. Stress, frustration, anxiety, and anger are typical reactions of both individuals being laid off and the job survivors. Exhibit 12-12 lists some of the ways that managers can lessen the trauma both for employees being laid off and for the survivors. I'm just going to leave these up. Now, sexual harassment is a serious issue in both public, uh, public and private sector organizations. During 2015, the latest data available, more than 6,800 complaints were led with the EEOC, and a drop from 7,944 in 2010. So it's a uh, looks like a drop. Um, although the most uh, complaints are led by women. Their percentage of charges led by males was 17.6. The costs of sexual harassment are high. Almost all Fortune 500 companies in the United States have had complaints lodged by employees, and at least um, a third have been sued. Settlements can range from low thousands to millions. And we're going to go over sexual harassment. Sorry about that. Any unwanted action or activity of a sexual nature that explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's employment, performance, or work environment. Now, is it any wonder that organizations are looking for ways to control their health care costs? How? Well, first, many organizations are providing opportunities for employees to lead healthy lifestyles. You know, from financial incentives to company-sponsored health and wellness programs, the, goals, uh, the goal is to limit rising health care costs. Now, about 41% of companies use some type of positive incentives aimed at encouraging healthy, healthy behavior, up from 34% in 1996. Um, obviously, the pension issue is one that directly affects human resource uh, decisions. On the one hand, organizations want to attract talented, capable employees by offering them desirable benefits such as pensions, but on the other hand, organizations have to balance offering benefits with the cost of providing such benefits. Pensions can be very expensive. So. In review of our first learning objective, human resource management is important for three reasons. First, 
it can be a significant um, source of competitive advantage. Second, it is an important part of the organizational strategies. And finally, the way organizations treat their people have been found to be significantly, um, they significantly impact the organization performance. In review of our second learning objective, the economy affects how employees view their work and has implications for how an organization manages its human resources. A labor union is an organization that represents workers and seeks to protect their interests through collective bargaining. In unionized organizations, human resource management practices are dictated by collective bargaining agreements. Human resource management practices are governed by a country's laws and not following those laws can be costly. Demographic trends such as changes in the racial and ethnic composition of the workforce, retiring baby boomers, and an expanding cohort of Generation Y workers will also have implications for HRM practices. In review of our third learning objective, human resource planning is the process by which managers ensure they have the right number of kinds of uh, capable people in the right places at the right times. Employers must cautiously uh, screen potential job applicants, and a valid selection device is characterized by a proven relationship between the uh, selection device and some relevant criterion. A reliable selection device indicates that it measures the same thing consistently. The different selection devices include application forms, written and performance simulation tests, interviews, background investigations, and in some cases physical exams. A realistic job preview is, in, is important because it gives an applicant more realistic expectations about the job, which in turn should increase employee job satisfaction and reduce turnover. Then re review of our fourth learning objective. Orientation is important because it results in an outsider-insider transition that makes the new employee feel comfortable and fairly well adjusted, lowers the likelihood of poor work performances, and reduces the probability of an early surprise uh, resignation. The most popular types of training include profession slash industry specific training, uh, management slash supervisory skills, mandatory slash compliance information, and customer service training. This training can be provided using traditional training methods, um, which encompass on the job, job rotation, mentoring and coaching, uh, experiential exercises, uh, workbooks slash manuals, and classroom lectures, or by technology-based methods which would encompass uh, CD slash DVD, uh, videotapes, audio tapes, video conferencing or teleconferencing or e-learning. In review of our fifth learning objective, a performance management system establishes performance standards used to evaluate employee performance. The different performance appraisal methods are written essays, uh, critical incidents, graphic rating scales, you have the bars technique, uh, multi-person comparisons, uh, MBO, which is management by objective, and the 360 degree appraisals. Now the factors that influence employee compensation and benefits include the employee's tenure and performance, the kind of job performed, kind of business slash industry, unionization, whether it is a labor or capital intensive, uh, management philosophy, 
uh, geographical location, company profitability, and the size of the company. Now the skill-based pay systems uh, reward employees for the job skills and competencies they can demonstrate. In a variable pay system, an employee's compensation is contingent on performance. In review of our sixth and final learning objective, managers can manage uh, downsizing by communicating openly and honestly, following appropriate laws regarding severance pay or benefits, providing support counseling for surviving employees, uh, reassigning roles according to individuals' talents and backgrounds, focusing on boosting morale, and having a plan for empty office spaces. Uh, sexual harassment is any unwanted action or activity of a sexual nature that explicitly or implicitly affects an individual's uh, employment, performance, or work environment. Managers need to be aware of what constitutes an offensive or hostile uh, work environment, educate employees on sexual harassment, and ensure that no retaliatory actions are taken against any person who files harassment charges. Also, they may need to have a policy in place for workplace romances. Organizations are dealing with work slash family life balance issues by offering family friendly uh, benefits such as on site child care, flex time, telecommuting, and so on. Managers need to understand that people may prefer programs that segment work and personal lives while others prefer programs that integrate their work and personal lives. Organizations are controlling human resource costs by controlling employee health care costs through employee health initiatives, that is, encouraging healthy behavior and penalizing unhealthy behaviors, and controlling employee pension plans by eliminating or severely limiting them. So thank you for your participation in the Chapter 12 lecture. Stay tuned for the Chapter 13 lecture. Until then, check Blackboard for the week's activities and assignments.